Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Cedar sinai Welcome to Virtual Medicine. Glad to see you all here up and early. My name is Brennan Spiegel. I'm the Director of Health Services Research here at Cedar sinai and the director of this course, and together with my co-director, Dr. Brandon Burkhead, who I think is running around somewhere. There he is. I want to thank you all and welcome you here to Cedar sinai for our second annual, annual uh, virtual medicine conference. We have uh, an amazing, incredible set of international speakers who we'll be hearing from for the next two days to talk about and explore and maybe even debate the role of immersive technologies in uh, patient care. And ultimately, this is truly about patients. That's why we hold this conference in a hospital. We could hold this conference across the street in a beautiful facility, in a hotel or in a convention center, but we hold it here in a hospital because above us, there are nearly a thousand beds. We have the largest hospital in the Western United States, and in those beds there are patients. And our patients, many, in many cases, are suffering. They suffer physically, they suffer emotionally, they suffer socially. So what we're here to talk about for the next two days is what is the role of technology to try and help the quality of life of our patients? And how can we responsibly begin communicating and using these technologies with our patients across the age spectrum? So I'm starting with this picture uh, of me with one of our now roughly 3,000 patients at Cedar sinai who has received therapeutic virtual reality. And she allowed us to show, show her image, uh, and she's contemplating for the first moment in this image whether or not she should consider using that headset for, uh, for pain management. And we've learned a lot in the last few years. Now, I want to start by uh, showing you a picture, and this is the same picture that I started with last year. I'm going to tell this story again for those of you that were here last year. Um, this is the story of the first time that I used virtual reality. I had never even heard of it uh, as of about four and a half years ago. Uh, that's how new I am to virtual reality. Uh, and Walter Greenleaf, who I think is in the room, and um, uh, Matthew Stout and Josh Sackman, who are here, all walked into my office. And they introduced me to VR, and they put this headset on my face. And next thing I know, I'm looking around, and this is my first-person perspective, going up the side of a building. And I thought, oh my god, I'm on the side of a building. And they said, just don't worry, you're, you're in a conference room. Your feet are on carpet. I realized that my body, I had an emotional response. I had this sense of presence that I was literally standing on top of this building. And it's an indelible experience that I still remember today. And I was noticing these details, like the shadows and the, the, the paint on the ground and the little dents in the bar, but I thought at least I'm safe, because I'm a little afraid of heights, but at least that bar is in front of me. And then it fell off, and they said, listen. And I went back against the wall, and I'm hyperventilating. I have the emotion of fear. I'm hyperventilating. I'm tachycardic. I have beads of sweat in my skin, dilated pupils. And they said, jump off. I said, no chance, I'm not going to jump off that thing. They said, they, you know that your feet are on carpet, right? And I said, my feet know that, but my brain does not know that. My brain thinks I'm going to die. Just jump off. And I just sat there and I thought, how am I going to do this? And the only way I was even able to do it is I had to cheat. I saw a little bit of light coming through the head-mounted display, and I saw a little patch of carpet, and I stared at it just enough to break the illusion and to fall 50 stories all the way down to my first virtual death. And that's the first time I used VR. And I thought, oh my god, if we can use it for evil, maybe we can use it for good. <laughs> so that was my first virtual death. And in the last year, I've had a second virtual death. And I want to tell you that story now, because it's opened up a whole way, new way of, for me of thinking about virtual reality. The second virtual death occurred in December of last year when I visited the University of Barcelona. And I visited the research laboratory of Dr. Mel Slater, who we'll be hearing from later today from Barcelona. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to physically make the trip, but we're going to hear from him. And he is extraordinary, and I can't wait to hear his talk later. Now, I, he introduced me to his laboratory, and he put me in this room, which is rather nondescript. There's a humming fluorescent light above these black walls, and his graduate student, Ramon Olivas, put a head-mounted display on my face and asked me to kick my feet up and rest them on that table. And I did. And this black, rather nondescript room turned into a beautiful living room when I put the headset on. And I looked around, and this is my first-person view. And I noticed the wood paneling and the chandelier, and it was very pleasant. 
and I kind of took it all in. And as I looked around, I noticed that there are all these different sort of objects, and it felt quite comfortable. And then what they asked me to do is to start moving my feet around on the table. And they drew these blue lines and asked me to trace the blue lines, and I did it. And I thought, wait a second, whose legs are those? Those legs are moving like my legs. Are those my legs? Because whose legs could they be if not mine? But those are, that's a digital doppelganger. That's an actual, you know, extraceptive phenomenon going through my eyeballs and convincing me through a digital parlor trick that I'm moving my legs. I had motion sensors on my legs, but those are not my legs. But as far as I was concerned, they must be my legs. They had to be. Well, he didn't stop there. Next thing that happened is these balls started falling from the ceiling. And each time one of the balls hit my body, I physically felt a haptic sensation. There are, there are haptic units in the suit, and there's perfectly timed, so I can actually kick these balls back and forth and feel them. And it was at this point that I had what Slater calls full body ownership. I was locked into this digital doppelganger. I had become this body. That body was me. But I knew that somewhere in that room there was a computer running thousands of lines of code to create these sphere spherical objects in my visual field that looked and felt like balls, but, and they were hitting me with an actual physical force. I started to wonder, where does my mind end and where does my body begin? But what happened next is a little hard to describe in words. I'm going to show it to you, and in two dimensions it really doesn't do justice to what I experienced, which is an indelible experience, one that is hard for me to even describe. Because what happened next, and maybe I was just a little disinhibited from the jet lag, but next thing I know, I have been pulled apart from my body. The observing I, literally the ego self, myself, had been pulled apart from that physical shell of a body below that I had just occupied. And these balls continued to move with me and continued to strike my body. My body now was up in the ceiling, disembodied, and looking back down on my vacant self. And I regarded that body down there, and I thought, that is me, and it is not moving. It is motionless. I have died. I am dead. And I sat there and I thought, how can I be so fooled? How can something so essential, like my physical coordinates in space and time, be violated through a digital parlor trick? And what does this mean about how my brain works and the connection between my brain and my body? I had a lot of questions after having an out-of-body experience, and I needed some answers, because as I sit here today, having been through that and seeing my dead self not moving, and that moment, just that indelible moment of seeing a motionless, vacant shell of a body, I can say that in a very small way, I fear death just a little bit less. And believe me, I'm afraid of dying, but just a little bit less. And I'll show you that Mel Slater has repeated this experiment, and others have come away with the same experience, the same cognitions. So where do you end and where does the world begin? This is an age-old question about mind and about body, and ultimately that is what we're talking about for the next two days, which is why we're starting off our session with Adam Ghazali and Diane Gramala to start talking about the connection between mind and body. This is an age-old question that Rene Descartes started asking in the mid-1600s, in 1644 in particular. He wrote some of his, one of his most famous treatises about the mind and the body, and at that time he drew this image. And this is what he imagined I was going through in that experience, that there are these physical phenomena around us, and they trigger our extraceptive systems, the senses on the surface of our body, in this case, the eyes. And the eyes took in this material phenomena, but then converts it somehow in the pineal gland, according to Descartes, into this immaterial essence, the thoughts that we have, and the, the stuff, the mind stuff is immaterial, and there's a mind which is immaterial, and there's a body that's material, and this is called dualism, that there is mind and there is body. And that historical precedent continues today, even in the way we practice medicine, even in the way that we think about neurology and psychiatry. And, you know, what he said at that time is the only thing he could know is that he cogitated, that he existed. He said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, but I can know nothing else about myself. I might as well just be a brain and a vat as Hilary Putnam said famously uh, many years ago, a brain just floating in a vat matrix style. Now it turns out, turns out, this is wrong. This is wrong. In fact, we have a much more interesting and nuanced understanding of the mind and body, and I want to spend a moment to go through it, because it will help me frame the next two days of our discussion on how virtual reality plays into all of this. Because this is what we now think is happening 
And this is based upon the work of, of, of Antonio Damasio at University of Southern California, a, 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 a preeminent neuroscientist. And the way he describes it, and this is from his paper, one of his papers in Nature, is that we experience the world, of course, through our senses. We have sensations, sight, sound, taste, smell, touch, vestibular, proprioceptive input. And we have an extraceptive system that takes all of that in. And this is rather unconscious. The brain detects these sensations as they enter the brain, but immediately passes that on, passes it on to the body. And this is key, because what Damasio describes as the next step is the generation of action programs that we call emotions. Now, typically, we think of emotions as things that happen in our mind, in our brain. But emotions, the modern neuroscientific thinking, is emotions occur in the body. We literally, we literally need a body in order to have emotions. We literally need a body in order to know anything. And that's, in a one sense, extraordinary, but at the same sense, kind of obvious. Because the brain and the body are physically connected, the sensory organs are an, are an extracranial extension of our brain. The whole thing is one continuous system. And if we can insert something in this, in this circuit, then we can manipulate brain and manipulate body. So what is the emotion of fear? Like I was standing on that, on that, uh, on that window washer rig. The emotion was not even in my brain. It was the tachycardia, it was the hyperventilation, it was the diaphoresis in my skin, it was the dilated pupils. What happens next, though, is for every one sensor that we have on the surface of our body, we have about 100,000 sensors on the inner part of our body, monitoring and surveying what Diane Gramala calls our wet inner world of wonder, constantly monitoring our innards to see if there's something astray or something awry. And in this case, our interoceptive system detects this emotion in the body, and it tells the brain finally that there's something going on, and we call that a feeling. It's different from an emotion. The feeling is the first mental experience of the emotion. That's when we register this fleeting notion that our body has been permuted or altered in a way uh, that has meaning. And that drives us to behave in ways to try and seek out positive emotions and avoid negative emotions. And this cycle continues and it codifies cognitions. This is what makes us human. The knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, preference, the feeling of knowing something. And that's where we start to change behavior and change lives. So I've spent some time going through this because where does VR fit into all of this and all the different ways that we can manipulate sensations? We can manipulate sensations by changing the world around our patients and around ourselves. And if we do it reliably and meaningfully and positively, those sensations can generate emotions in the body and feelings in the brain and ultimately cognitions. And this is what VR, therapeutic VR, is about, as I see it, through the lens of modern neuroscience. And we have a preeminent neuroscientist who may be able to correct anything that I've said. And there's Diane as well, so we'll hear more about this. I'm, an, I'm a gastroenterologist, so what do I know? Actually, in GI, we spend a lot of time talking about the way the brain and the gut communicate. We call that the brain-gut axis. Now, here is a study that I want to bring back of other people going through Mel Slater's experience. And what he demonstrated in this is that, yes, it can affect the body, but more importantly, it forged cognitions. In this study, they measured cognitions about fear of dying, about anxiety about the shortness of life or dying young or what it feels like to be dead. And in this study, he was able to demonstrate that going through this out-of-body experience did actually alter people's perceptions about their death compared to a control group, very importantly showing that in this instance, something very fundamental, a cognition about your existential, about your existence, can be modified by virtual reality. So VR is a tool that modifies perception. That's what it does, and Itai Danovich discussed this last year and spent a, we had a great talk about this notion of VR modifying perception, and you can check out his talk from last year, and he'll continue this year. So what that means to me is when it's used to recalibrate unhealthy perceptions, VR becomes a radical new therapy to potentially improve quality of life. It is not a panacea to, to, for all grievous suffering. It will not work in everyone every time, and we need to respect that and recognize that, very importantly. But when used correctly, at the right time, in the right patient, with the right program, the three rights, then when we get it right, we can make a difference in people's lives, and we've seen it firsthand. Now, with this background, I now want to create a framework for you 
to, that helps me think about VR and helps hopefully think about the next two days of this conference. Because we are talking about perceptions of the world and how to recalibrate them. We could have unhealthy perceptions about the outer world around us, and we can have unhealthy perceptions about the wet inner world of wonder, as Diane calls it, inside of us. We can have too much feeling, too much mental exposure to the outer world or the inner world, and in fact, we can have too little feeling about the inner world and the outer world. This creates a two-by-two two table, four quadrants. Within each quadrant is a unique mechanism of action by which virtual reality works. And as I start to think about treating patients as a doctor with VR, I'm thinking, what is the mechanism of action? How is VR working? Because that's how I think about pharmacotherapy. I don't just give everyone the same drug therapy or else I'd be a really bad doctor. I need to think about which VR therapy am I giving to whom? The right therapy for the right patient at the right time. So what are the rights? How do we figure out what is the right treatment for the right patient? In the upper left quadrant is the world of high extraception. This is where we are ruminating and hypervigilantly looking around the world and thinking that that person treated me poorly and I don't like what's going to happen and I'm worried about the future and I'm lamenting the past. Anxiety, future, depression, past. This is a set of conditions that afflicts half of humankind. How do we address this? What does meditation do? What do psychedelics do? Uh, well, what they all do is they calm that inner monkey mind, as, as Buddha called it, the jabbering you know, the critiquing, fretting mind bouncing around inside of our head. We want to promote cognitive flow in this instance, and VR can achieve that, and I'll talk about that. In the upper right, that same ruminating, hypervigilant mind has now turned its spotlight of attention inward and is focusing on the interceptive signals coming up from within the body. This is, in some cases, the basis of chronic pain, and we'll hear more about that this morning. As I said, visceral anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, a condition that I study a lot, is in many cases a problem with high interception. Here we need to dampen inner pain signals. In the bottom, we have different conditions altogether, whereas in the top, the self is hypervigilant. The ego is, is putting borders between self and other. In the bottom, we have a condition, set of conditions where there's low extraception, where there's almost a fluidity between self and others. The self has been disintegrated. Consider schizophrenia, where literally a schizophrenic is being invaded by voices, being invaded by sights and sounds that he or she cannot control. There is a breakdown in the self, a fractured self. Same thing with dementia in a very different set of conditions. Here the idea is to strengthen self-identity, and VR can do that as well, and we'll talk about that. And then the final opportunity is the bottom right, where we have low interception, where we have lost the ability to perceive the important signals inside of our body. Think about obesity, for example, a condition where we've literally lost the ability to feel what it's like to be full and to recognize that fullness and to drive and act in a way that minimizes that fullness. That's a simple example, but there are many others, of body neglect and so on. Here, VR can enhance healthy body attention. So I spent all this time going through that because these are the four quadrants of the VR pharmacy. These are the shelves of the VR pharmacy. And each one of them has an opportunity for a therapeutic intervention. Okay, we, each one of these has a set of different treatments that we can consider using that we can then apply with a known mechanism of action to a known patient. Think about this upper left example from Trip VR using incredible graphics binaural beats within, within the ear, personalized worlds to intervene with patients and to create this sense of flow and tranquility for anxiety and depression. Or the upper right, where applied VR is using the same concepts but focusing it on pain. How do we dampen those inner pain signals? In the bottom we have an incredible story of a woman who is demented and is in these morbid depths of bewilderment and crying and screaming, and then she puts on a VR headset and has been transported to her childhood, and is singing, and is coherent, and has regained her childhood. Her fractured self has been restored. And then, on the bottom right, we have an example of, at virtu of, of uh, here at Cedar sinai using uh, virtual reality to regain a sense of what's happening inside the body in the setting of hypertension. How is salt affecting the kidneys and the heart and the brain and re-engaging the mind and body around those interceptive signals? This is the VRX. This is the virtual pharmacy. And this is how I think about as new treatments are being, every time somebody comes to me, I think, what is this doing? And where in the pharmacy does it belong? So I want to talk now briefly about the quadrants and just give some other examples and talk about that upper left quadrant of promoting cognitive flow. And I mentioned earlier that 
There are all sorts of ways that we try to turn off that inner jabbering, critiquing, fretting monkey mind. And, you know, one of, of course, is meditation. I try to meditate whenever I can. It takes, as many of you know, a lot of practice. It's, it's not easy to do to turn off that, that monkey mind. And there are neuroanatomic correlates of that fretting, you know, jabbering mind. Uh, one, a set of, of, of structures is called the default mode network, or the DMN, which is basically that part of the brain that's just bugging you all the time when you want it to quiet down. And that's part of what meditation does. We can do this pharmacologically as well. Right? We can use psilocybin or magic mushrooms, which completely dissolve the default mode network and completely dissolve the ego and the self. And that's why people say, I've become that tree when they're in psychedelics, or I'm, I'm you, I've become the world. What's happened? Complete dissolution of the ego. So there is complete fluidity between self and other. There is no boundary between self and other in the setting of psychedelics. Does VR work this way too? Well, this is an amazing study by Neil Seth, published out of the UK, where he did a head-to-head -head study of virtual reality against psilocybin, the magic mushroom. He literally gave people psychedelics, and they described the phenomenology or the felt experience of being uh, on a psychedelic, and had a, a control group that underwent this bizarre experience in virtual reality using uh, Google DeepStream, looking around and seeing these funny dogs on people's heads as they walk by in a University of Sussex campus. And he compared them head to head across 14 different attributes of, of mysticism, essentially, of this felt experience. And if you can look at this map, which is called a radar diagram, you see that there's basically a perfect overlap between the two experiences. And I'm not showing you the control group, which had a very different uh, map on this, but what, what he demonstrated was an, a nearly equivalent phenomenology between the VR experience and the psychedelic experience. So VR has this ability to counteract the ruminating mind. And we've been seeing this firsthand here at Cedar sinai This is a uh, VR experience, a 360 video called, created by the Dolphin Swim Club. And uh, we use this all the time in our patients. And just recently, I had a patient who was hospitalized for abdominal pain and anxiety. And the pain was severe, and she was in the hospital, and they called us in, because I'm a GI doctor, to see if we can figure this out. But she had had every test. She had had an endoscopy, and a CT scan, and blood tests, and everything was normal. And we put this on her, and after about four minutes of silence, she said, I think I know why I have this pain. And I said, tell me more. She said, it's my brother. Your brother? Yeah, it's my brother. He had stomach cancer, and he died. And I'm sure I do too, and I'm going to die like he died. I said, but we've been in your stomach. You don't have stomach cancer. She said, I know that, but I have not been willing to hear that. I haven't been willing to accept that. But these dolphins are telling me I need to. It's remarkable, just remarkable. She said, I could have been on the couch for a year and I would not have come to this conclusion. So what was happening in her brain at that moment? I don't have a functional MRI scan in the hospital to, you know, to roll around, but I suspect that it was like a temporary psychedelic, that we had inhibited that ruminating mind. It was like asking the conductor of the orchestra to leave and let the rest of the orchestra kind of have jam sessions. That could be cacophonous, but they can also have amazing music. And the rest of her brain was able to start making connections that it normally wouldn't, because it was all normally going through that central hub of the ego self, which had dissolved temporarily to allow this insight. And we've seen this over and over again. It doesn't work in all people at all times, but when it works, it works. And we've seen this over and over again. And there's a number of studies now, beyond just in, in individual anecdotes, and these are some, and we'll hear about more, that are demonstrating the benefits of VR for anxiety and for depression. The bottom paper is extraordinary, and we'll hear more about it from Mel Slater, conversations between self and self as Sigmund Freud. This is a virtual body ownership paradigm for self-counseling in virtual reality. I want to show you my own self-counseling in a second here. When I went to his laboratory, uh, they, uh, they scanned me, and they asked me to sort of stand there, kind of like a wax doll or something, and, and as they walked around, they, they took this video of me, and they took an avatar of my body, a three-dimensional re recomposition, so that they can put me into a VR world, a virtual world. Now, it turned out, just two weeks before this, my mentor, who's the famous Dr. Daniel Dennett from Tufts University, a philosopher of mine, wrote the book Consciousness Explained. He had been in this lab two weeks earlier. I have not seen him for over 30 years, but he was in this lab too, and they had a scan of his body as well. So they actually put me in this room across from Daniel Dennett, and this is what happened. Now look in the mirror to your left. 
When the light next to you turns green, explain the challenge to the person in front of you using your own words. How can I explain consciousness without invoking a god? Something that was on my mind a lot when I first took his classes. Why do you need to invoke a god? I don't understand why that even matters. Uh, it's hard to explain otherwise how what seems like an immaterial experience can be conveyed through material substance. Well, that's a classic uh, dualistic concept that the mind and the body are separate and distinct, but there's no reason to invoke an immaterial component to our consciousness in the first place, so sort of a false premise. Now that's me talking to me. I don't know if you caught that. That's me talking through him in his voice, permuted to sound exactly like him, talking back to me. So I am having a debate with myself, and once again I have lost to Daniel Dennett. <laughs> so this approach of using VR it, it, what it, it is, is opening up headspace to, re to, to turn that thinking, cogitating mind back on, but in a more helpful and useful way. This is what talk therapy does. And in this particular study, it was used in people with depression and demonstrate not just over minutes or hours, but over days and weeks, reductions in, in standard depression scale scores. So I want to now, in my last few minutes, talk about the upper white, right quadrant, this, op, this area where we have high interoception, dampening inner pain signals. And this, we know from extensive research, is an area where VR just seems to thrive. This is now a famous image from Hunter Hoffman, over a decade old now, looking at functional MRI scans of the brain on VR and off VR. And in this instance, this is an experimental setup where there's a heat probe applied to the leg, um, I was describing this to my daughter the other day, and she said, I'm not signing up for that study. What did the IRB say about that? I said, well, I don't know. I guess people sign up for studies to get burned. But it actually is a, uh, it's not an injurious thermal injury. But the point is, it hurts. And look at the difference. I want you to see two things about this picture. Not only on the right are there fewer signals, like the colors are less, but look where they're located. There are colors on the surface of the brain in the sensory cortex where we're feeling the intensity, but also kind of in the middle. We have a brain expert here as well. The limbic part, the emotional centers, the insula, where we're kind of processing the emotional aspect of pain. And this is so important because pain has two arrows, as Buddha called it. Buddha said there were two arrows of pain. The first is when the archer strikes us, and it hurts. It hurts. But the second is self-inflicted. That's the arrow of cogitating about that first arrow. That's the part where we wonder, what's this mean about my life? Am I going to die? What's happening to me? That, is there an injury inside of me? So, you know, Buddha said that uh, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. That, that suggests that there are two components to pain, and it looks like VR can address both on the functional MRI scans and in clinical trials. This is a study we're going to hear about more tomorrow from Melissa Wong, but a quick preview this is a randomized trial of women going through labor and delivery with VR and without VR. And we'll hear more about this tomorrow from the University of Michigan, this particular study. But look in particular, not only is there a difference in favor of virtual reality, which is the, uh, the, the clear bars, but there's a difference in not just the intensity, the sensory experience of the pain, but also the emotional experience, the time spent thinking about pain, the cognitive experience, the unpleasantness of the pain, the affective experience. And Hunter Hoffman has demonstrated this as well with burn patients. So there are two arrows to pain, and VR seems to address both. How is it working? How is VR doing this? Well, it probably is, is a few different mechanisms. We know that normally when there's an injury, there's a peripheral uh, nerve that then hands off the pain signal essentially to the spinal thalamic tract, the secondary ascending nerves that go up the spinal cord, hit the thalamus, which is this way station that just determines which part of the brain needs to hurt and maps that part of the brain to the part of the body that's injured. That's kind of the classic uh, view of pain. What happens when the brain is on VR? Well, a few things. There's central pain modulation. The first is this notion of inattentional blindness, something that is beautifully described in The Distracted Mind, uh, which is a book by Adam Ghazali, uh, where the idea is that we have this bandwidth of attention, this spotlight of attention, and we can only take in so much at once. Like very few of you, if any of you, are right now actively thinking about the pressure of the chair on your bottom, 
or how many times you've blinked in the last minute, because you don't have time or need to think about those things right now, because we're at a VR conference. So when uh, pain signals are coming up, it may be harder to overcome that, to distract from that, but if we get this sort of Trojan, photonic Trojan horse entering through our eyes and blasting through our head, we might actually be able to, uh, to distract our body from, or distract our mind from those pain signals. The other thing it does, and this has been shown multiple times now, is this perception of time contraction. Time seems to go faster when people are in pain on VR. That's been shown in the childbirth studies and others. But there's another important point. The brain doesn't just sit there passively taking in all this pain. The brain can fight back. The brain can also send signals down the spinal cord, descending inhibitory pathways, and say, I've had enough of this, I don't have time for pain. But the brain needs to be in the right kind of mood to be able to do that. If the brain is anxious, then maybe those pain signals are important to know about, and it's going to let them in. But if the brain's trying to relax and be meditative, it doesn't have time to be bothered by pain, and it can send signals down through the periaqueductal gray parts of the brain, sends down these inhibitory pathways, and then there's all sorts of stuff that goes on in here. These signals from the brain activate an inhibitory neuron, which sprays out enkephalins, which are a natural opioid. We're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. We all have an opioid epidemic happening in our spinal cord, because we have natural opioids that if we think about how to deploy them correctly, we might be able to achieve some analgesia just through descending pain inhibitory pathways. So this is another way that we think, although it's hard to prove, that VR works. All right, I'm gonna end my comments with the bottom two quadrants and talk a little bit about this notion now of too little feeling about the outer world. And I gave the example of schizophrenia. And this is an amazing study by Tom Craig out of King's College in London, where what he's doing and others in Canada and elsewhere is using virtual reality and other types of avatars, including 2D avatars, to give a voice, to give a, a physical face to the voices that schizophrenics are hearing. And what the schizophrenic patients are asked to do is to create a face um, through a very sophisticated program that looks like the face that they see and a voice that's permuted to sound like the voice and then to face up to their demons. And here's an example of that. You're a waste of space. Can you go away, please? That's good, Lauren. That's good. But can you try and make it a bit stronger for me? S sit up, look at him, and tell him to go away, OK? So he's literally voicing the demons in this, in this interactive experience. Now, this is on a 2D screen. Maybe with the VR, the presence is enhanced. And this has been shown in multiple studies now to be effective. It's not just a gimmick. It actually can reduce the uh, the frequency and intensity of, of auditory verbal hallucinations in people with psychosis. I'll end here at the bottom right, this idea of enhancing healthy body attention. And I want to give uh, three brief examples of very different use cases, where in all these cases, we've sort of lost some ability to be connected with our inner self. So I mentioned obesity earlier, and scientists at the University of Tokyo have been doing this amazing study where they use virtual reality headsets to physically change the size of a meal. So in this case, they're looking at an Oreo cookie and expanding it so it literally feels bigger. And then what they do is they give this to people, and in this case, here's a test subject, and they've asked this person to eat as many cookies as he can before he gets full. And after, I think, 12 cookies, he said, I've had enough. But they bring him back another day, and now the cookies look really big, but they're the same size, and he just gets full and says he's done after about six or seven cookies. And they've been able to demonstrate this over and over again, that literally we can recalibrate the perception of, 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 of fullness by changing the physical perception of the meal size itself. Now, we're not going to go to probably you know, dinner wearing headsets, but if we can train the brain to recalibrate these inner sensations, then maybe we can, uh, we can help make inroads with uh, calorie ingestion and, and, and caloric intake. Uh, I mentioned earlier this idea of using VR to help engage people with their body, and this is a, a visualization that we created for people with high blood pressure, uh, and they can fly into their kidneys and see them becoming damaged with high salt in their diet. And we've actually demonstrated in an uncontrolled case series um, a reduction in blood pressure using this as part of a larger program, and that was covered at last year's conference. Rehabilitation is another 
a uh, completely different area, but stroke or, um, or uh, amputations, amputated limbs, you literally have lost a connection with yourself and need to find a way to strengthen that connection. And you know, this is an area that's been very well established. This is a commercial from Samsung that you may have seen. I got so but I'm not a soldier. So we have a number of companies here that are doing that, and I encourage you to go around and find out more about that and also look at the research, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, MindMaze in particular is an example of a company with an FDA-cleared product for stroke rehabilitation. So this is about the VRX, and uh, I'm just about done here, but we're here to talk about the VR pharmacy. And because uh, we're scientists, we need to think about the rigor, and we need to think about the evidence uh, that's supporting this uh, before we bring our patients the right treatment at the, for the right patient at the right time. And in your, uh, in your inserts, in your bags, is, an, is this abstract that we just recently published uh, with many people in this room um, who participated in what's called the VR Core, uh, the Clinical Outcome Research Experts group of uh, over 20 individuals, some of whom will be speaking shortly, uh, of some guidance and suggestions around clinical trials in virtual reality. And just like FDA has phase one, two, and three trials, in this paper, we're suggesting VR1, VR2, and VR3 trials. Brandon Burkhead will discuss this tomorrow, and this is a free online article, open access, so that you can look at it if you're interested. So since we're in Hollywood, I'm going to end with a scroll, because there's so many people that uh, are, I want to thank for this conference, uh, many of whom are, uh, have worked very hard tirelessly, Taylor Dupuy, Kathy Oka, Mishana Theory, uh, Theory, and many others who have participated in putting this whole thing together, and all of our different um, collaborators and people at Cedar sinai who have helped to put this together. So without further ado, I just want to thank you all again for being here and introduce our next speaker.